the significance of the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Sometimes um, we just read over certain things as we're going through Scripture, and we kind of miss some really important truths. And I just never thought the question I'd known. I can remember one of my earliest childhood church member memories, and I was a uh, I was a wise man in a Christmas play in my church, and uh, you know, so I've known about gold, frankincense, and myrrh since I, you know, I remember. But I never thought to question what was the significance of those three things. And as I began to unfold it and study it, I started realizing, um, as many of you already know, like this is not just one sermon, this is many sermons. And it's just amazing how God's Word can be that deep. That being said, because of the circumstances last week, we didn't have to miss the second part of this series. And I, and I did want to kind of bring it to a close tonight. So we will be looking at frankincense and myrrh and kind of touching on gold again. And it's kind of a teaching, and I'll probably preach as well because that's just how I'm wired. So <laughs> let's pray. Jesus, and I am thankful that you have wired me that way. I'm thankful, Lord Jesus, <clears throat> that I'm no longer no longer the man I once was. I'm thankful, Lord Jesus, that by your grace alone I could stand up here today and preach your word. And by your grace alone I stand here before this group of people completely unworthy and undeserving to be a preacher of your word. What a privilege it is, though, Lord, that you would lay this at my feet. What a responsibility it is. And I'm just so thankful Lord, that you have empowered me to do this, this thing. I'm just asking for your anointing, Lord Jesus. And I'm asking for open hearts, open ears, open minds. Lord, so that you can work amongst this room. I thank you for the powerful sense of your presence being upon this service right now. I'm thankful, Lord, that you are right here amongst us. We are gathered in your name, Lord Jesus. And you seven, two or more are gathered in my name, you will. I will always be in the midst of them. And I'm thankful, Lord, that you are willing to do that. That in and of itself is just such a privilege. It's just astounding to me that you would want to be in the midst of all of us. But you do, Lord. You're very personal. You love us very deeply. You're more interested in our salvation than we are. And so, Lord Jesus, take us deep. Take us to the depths of your word. Take us to the depths of the conviction of your Holy Spirit. Guide us and direct us into all truth, into all light, Lord Jesus, on this special day in which this world has chosen to celebrate God coming off his throne, becoming the size of a human embryo in a young woman named Mary. Coming to us, Lord Jesus, because we couldn't save ourselves. But you came to save. You came to set free. You came to break bondage. You came to bring victory. And we thank you for that. Guide us and direct us now, Lord Jesus, and use my tongue any way you see fit. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Wise men seek Jesus. Wise men seek Jesus. In the Christmas narrative, we traditionally think of three wise men who sought out the presence of Jesus. They wanted an audience with God in the flesh. Why like three wise men? There could have been many more. But we only know of three because of the number of gifts they brought to offer the Lord Jesus Christ. Proverbs 14.6 defines a wise man as, A wise man fears God and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. The gift that Jesus wants from his people is us. He wants us to be God confident. He wants all of us. Christianity is nothing short of a total dependency on God for all things. Again, we remember these men were from the east. As we went over that a couple of weeks ago. These men were from the east. They had Jewish influence in their culture most likely just because of the dispersion, just because of the Babylonian <clears throat> captivity and the things of that nature. They had access to the scriptures. They had heard 
of the Jewish God, the Jewish Messiah. We can assume those things <clears throat> from Scripture because these people had come from the east and were going west to seek the coming Messiah. These people were obviously uh, wise. Judaism had reached into Eastern culture hundreds of years before Christ was ever born. I wouldn't doubt that these wise men were very familiar with the scriptures like the uh, prophecy we see in Matthew um, chapter 2 and verse 6. But you, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And of course, and they had Isaiah at this time as well, which a lot of people would have called the sixth gospel. It was so filled full of um, messianic prophecy. We could use this example that these men took in our own lives. They set out to seek God. And when we seek God, we should always turn to Scripture. It will always point us to truth. That's right. Trying to seek God apart from Scripture will always lead us in error. We must have a check for the truth that we, uh, that we are seeking and God's revelation to man is His Word. Trying to be a Christian apart from the Word of God is, I would say in this day and time, impossible. People did it before, before they had the written Word in almost every language. But we are really without excuse without getting in the Word with, you know, we've got the Word of God so readily available to us. Well, these wise men, they were seeking truth and they found it wrapped in a manger among the beasts. A humble beginning for the incarnate God, man, who will soon change the course of the world forever. Let's pick up at verse uh, chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold because Jesus is the eternal king. We just sang about that. Frankincense, because Jesus is the eternal high priest. Myrrh, in which I want to save for last, we will cover in a moment. It will make a whole lot of sense. So why did these wise men bring these three specific gifts? I don't know if you've ever questioned that, but I did. After I was saved, I said, why, why frankincense? You know what frankincense is? It's just incense. It's, it's incense. Why and why gold? Why you know that seems like such much more extravagant gift than incense, you know? And then myrrh was just some herbs. Now I don't know about you guys, but if one person gave me here's a lump of gold, I'm like whoa, you've got to be kidding me! This is this is I can pay my rent for three years. And then the next person says, here's frankincense. Okay. <laughs> cool. I mean, that's practical. I can use that. And here's some myrrh. Man, that is pungent. That really smells good. <laughs> Thank you. But when we understand what these things represent, we really begin to understand the depth of the wisdom and the knowledge that these men have. That was always, I, I mean, it's just one of those things that's like, I don't know about you all, but, you know, I'd read through the Christmas narrative and I would read, okay, they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's got to be some sort of meaning to that, but there's also all these other scriptures that I can talk But as I began to research that, and it just caught my eye, I was like, my goodness. I mean, I just about wanted to weep. The wise men brought frankincense because frankincense was the incense that was used in temple worship 
to the Most High God in Judaism. The priests would use frankincense during their times of worship as they were leading Israel in worship and atoning for sins for the whole nation of Israel. The implication of this is, as priests used this incense to worship, they were acknowledging that Jesus was their high priest. Not only were they bringing him gold, saying that Jesus is our king, we oftentimes forget that Jesus is also our high priest. He is a God king. He is a priestly king. <clears throat> there was a video not too long ago that came out. I don't want to rabbit trail too much on this. But this guy said, you know, I love Jesus, but I hate religion. Well, I hate to tell that guy, but Jesus loves religion. He really does. We need to kind of get past that. He loves the sacraments. He commanded us to do those things. He loved for His people to meet together and worship Him. He loved those things. Jesus instituted those things because He is a high priest. He is a high priest who has made reconciliation for us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17 says, Therefore, in all things He had to be made like His brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That good <laughs> word there, and sometimes we can skip over, propitiation means to make atonement for. He took the death that we deserved. While all of the priests before that were sacrificing the bulls and goats and going through all the ritual sacrifices and all that, he was the only priest I said, my blood is sufficient for your sin. That's right. My blood is sufficient for your sin. We have a high priest, my friends, that meets, that meets our needs and understands our human weaknesses. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but Jesus had the most, the, he had more problems out of the temple priesthood than he did anybody else when he came into ministry. Did you notice that? And I'll tell you, tell you why. These people had become so self-righteous, they had become detached from human weakness. They had become sort of detached from what it was like to be a normal human being trying to struggle through life outside of those temple walls. That was one of their fundamental problems. That's why we still today call people that live that way Pharisees, because that is... They just seem like they're just detached from reality, self-righteous, and totally dependent upon religion other than Jesus. So Jesus came and understood to understand our human weakness. And I don't begin to understand all of that. I really don't. I don't claim to. I don't claim to understand how God could pour Himself out to understand human weakness. But the Scripture says... He sympathizes as our high priest. He sympathizes with those who are tempted. Hebrews 2.18 says, for, that in, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus put himself into a position. Now, he was completely sinless from birth unto death, or he could not have done what he did. But he put himself into a position of weakness where he could have sinned. He could have, but he didn't. That's what makes the gospel so miraculous. Puts it in, to me, that's one of those things. It's like this is an incredible thought here. This is an incredible thought. And it's not a blasphemous thought. It's just what the, it's what the, the scriptures say. His, he had a personal understanding of temptation. Because he knew, he knew, he, he knew what we would be faced with. He knew what we would be faced with. It says, no temptation has overtaken you such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. God wanted a personal Personal, what's the word that's trying to come out of my mouth? It just won't come. 
He wanted a personal experience of the weakness of the flesh. He wanted to personally experience that. <clears throat> that has a couple of implications on us. One, if we want to look at the glasses half full, we have the power to overcome all sin in our life. That's an amazing thing. We have the power to overcome any and every sin that comes our way. Secondly, we are without excuse because God has said with every temptation, He has made a way of escape. There is no excuse good enough to excuse you from the penalty of rebelling against God. God has given us victory that saves us from sin. The scripture and the story of the incarnation itself, if you turn one little page over, it tells you the purpose and the, the method of Jesus' salvation. In Matthew chapter 1, in verse 21, the angel told Joseph, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Not in their sins, but from their sins. That's the method of salvation, is to be saved from sin. Whereas before, what the high priest in the temple could do was make atonement for your sin, provide a covering for your sin, which is the way it's preached quite a bit today, today as well. But something changed when Jesus died upon that cross. Something changed when Jesus became our high priest. He said, not only do I provide a covering, but I will provide you the power to overcome sin. That shall be your covering. You see, he provides this kind of victory because he knows what it's like to be weak. He knows what it's like to be weak. By faith, we can overcome these things. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with their weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. And a lot of people would try to say that, well, that's Jesus. So, I mean, he was perfect in every way. and he was all, But he also said, you shall be perfect. This is my Father in heaven is perfect. And what we do and what we have done in this culture today is what, and so much of preaching has lessened, lessened, and lessened the effect of salvation down to where victory is just going to heaven one day as long as I just kind of hold on to something. But it's so much more than that. It is so much more than that. Our high priest has given us a salvation that overcomes sin and temptation in this world. To overcome the, the ways of this world to overcome the evil and greater is he that is in us and he that is in the world. And he's a priest that we can trust. We can trust him. You see, our high priest obtained redemption for us. As I said earlier, the earthly priesthood could only make earthly sacrifices for us, but Jesus gave himself. Real love always includes making a choice to love the person. It's not just feelings. It's not just something fuzzy. Jesus made it real. He made it real. Hebrews 9.12 tells us, not with the blood of goats and calves, with His own blood, He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He's done that for each and every one of us. That's something that the temple priests could never do. They could never do that. Not to this degree. And when His power comes into your life, you're able to overcome. It's a desire change. It's overcoming evil in your heart. Our high priest, Jesus, and here's something that no human priest could ever do. And take all of that, I believe. You take all of that and, and set it aside. And I don't think anything can compare to this truth right here. That he imparts his very own righteousness to us. You know what that means? That means he takes his righteousness. And he puts that in you. Not just on you. Not just on you. He doesn't just clothe you with it. He doesn't just look at you as righteous. He puts His righteousness in 
you. That's why Jesus could say, beyond any shadow of a doubt, you will know them by their fruit. That means you will know them by the choices that they make. You will know them by the conversations that they have. You will know them by the lifestyle they choose to live. You will know Christians. They won't have to tell you they're a Christian. They won't have to make an excuse for things. You will know them. You'll be able to look at them. You will have fellowship with them. You will want them to pray for you. You will recognize them as followers of Jesus Christ. You know why Jesus could say that? Because the plan of redemption meant Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what Colossians 1, 26, 27 says. Yeah. You will be like Christ. There's no way you can avoid that. You can't avoid that. Oh, I'll tell you, when I got saved, it was a total life change for me. It was a total mindset change for me. I said, I don't have to walk in the ways. Matter of fact, I don't want to walk in the ways that I used to. And so many people say, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. I'm going to tell you, my friends, you don't have to struggle. You can come up to this altar tonight and lay it down and say, I'm done with the struggle. I just want to live for Jesus. God can redeem any awful situation. He can do it. You know that last week, a lifelong friend of mine got saved. I've been praying for him for four years. Up until that point, he wouldn't care to tell you this at all. He said, you know, I thought I was a Christian. I really thought I was saved. I really thought I was a Christian. He said, but I'll tell you something. I've, I've been around you guys for about three days. And he heard the message at my father's funeral. And it brought conviction upon his heart so strong. He had to sit at the edge of my bed for three hours to try to reconcile what was going on in his heart. And he finally understood that he was not saved. And he wanted to be. That man said that, <clears throat> he said, you know, that I couldn't sleep because my mind was going a million miles an hour all the time. I could not. I had no peace. I had no joy. I had nothing. He told me after he prayed through for salvation, he, he looked at me almost with a tear in his eye. And he said, you know, all those voices stopped. I don't have to worry about anything anymore. Amen. I don't think I need my sleep medication anymore. You know what he did? It was about 1 o'clock in the morning. He stood up and he went into our guest bed. He laid down within 30 seconds. He was asleep. Mm -hmm. This is from somebody who was taking the strongest sleep medication that, he could, that, that is prescribed the day before. Now you tell me that salvation is not a radical change in somebody's life. It is Jesus the victory and all that he has ever purchased coming inside of you. So often that's hardly even preached in the context of the gospel. It's so sad. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but so many gospel presentations are saying anymore. It's like, if you want to get saved, raise your hand and we'll come here and we'll pray this prayer over top of you and then you know, and you go on your merry way and try to leave Try to live life and just, just trust that you're saved. No, my friends, it is, it is Christ coming into your life. It's, it's the heavenly high priest coming into your life and changing you radically. And in a moment, I'm talking about from one second to another, in a moment, you're changed. All the rituals of that Mosaic covenant couldn't make a person holy in the inward life. It can only provide a covering. You can only satisfy God's wrath. And Jesus satisfied God's wrath by climbing onto the cross. You know, it wasn't nails that held Jesus up there. It was His love for us that held Him up there. He was God in the flesh. He could have disintegrated that cross and smited every person that was spitting on Him right there. He could have done it, but He chose not to. Because love requires a choice. And he was choosing to give himself for us. He died a death. And then he rose from the dead. So that he could impart his righteousness into you. Jesus is the only priest in history 
that can give righteousness to those who meet the conditions of repentance and faith and ask Him for it. Titus 2, 11 through 14 plainly tells us, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, and He might redeem us from every lawless deed, not some of them, every lawless deed and purify for himself. He wants you to be pure. Purify for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. You know what good works means? That means zealous for living for Jesus Christ, not just believing on him, settling, your, settling everything and saying, well, I believe on it. I really believe in Jesus. But he wants more than just a belief. He wants a life. He wants a life that he can live through. That's why we were designed the way we were designed. In God's image, you were made. We were made in God's image. So wouldn't it make sense that He would want to make you into His image on the inward parts as well? Right. He is our high priest. This is not my religion. Christianity is not my religion. It's what I profess to follow. This is Jesus' religion. This is the thing that he created. This is the gospel that he preached and that every true prophet after him preached. This is the kind of religion that doesn't just make you feel good. It makes you good. It makes you holy. It makes you true. It makes you righteous. It makes you pure. By His Holy Spirit coming and dwelling within you and living a life through you. And if that wasn't enough, our high priest gave us the most beautiful model, took the most important thing, and even right now at the right hand of the Father, it should be an example for every one of us because we are a priesthood of believers, is at the right hand of the Father praying or you. That's what he's doing. He right now is praying for you. Interceding at the right hand of the Father. There's people that I call up when I need prayer that I know God hears their prayers and this is an urgent prayer and I need you to pray for this. It's a privilege for anybody to call me and say, I trust you, Bill, with this prayer, prayer please pray for me. You'll pray. That is the greatest compliment I think anybody could ever give somebody in their Christian walk. And so here is Jesus. You think God doesn't hear His prayers? Praying for us at the Father's right hand. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore He is also able to save to the uttermost. I love that word uttermost. That means He can save you beyond anything you've ever imagined. There's not one thing on this earth that He cannot save you from. There's not one thing on this earth that people cannot... I talked to somebody last night that said, I don't know if I should pray for this person. Bill, they, they might even be reprobated. I'm not sure. I said, listen to me, brother. Now, I can tell you the only reason that I'm where I'm at today is because I came home from four days of partying and was looking for more drugs, and two girls that I worked with that were Christians decided to take their lunch break and go out and intercede for my salvation. Within five months, I was put in jail. Within a month after that, I was saved, and I've been preaching the gospel ever since. Now listen, I was a drug addict. I was an atheist. I was everything contrary to Christianity. Just everything in my life was wicked looking back at it. You know what this person, the only thing wrong with the person they were talking about was they said, well, he goes to church and doesn't take it serious enough. I said, well, listen, buddy, at least he's going to church. <laughs> at least he's going to church. I wouldn't have sat foot in one. If God can save me, there's nobody in this room he can't save. There's nobody in this room he couldn't give victory over. I mean, this is how I feel about it. 
He is able to save to the uttermost, to the absolute ends of the earth. Just He can save you. There's not one sin that He can't save you from. But that's the, that's the problem today is we don't talk about salvation from sin. We talk about salvation in sin. But God's just going to forgive you and you can go on living life and that false doctrine sends so many people to hell. I'm going to tell you something, friends. He wants to save you from sin. He wants to take you out of the sin life and put you into the holy life and put you on the holy way and He wants to guide you and direct you and make you holy and live a life through you that is just supernatural and powerful and beautiful and lovely. And there's times that the life will hit you so hard that you don't even know what you're going to hold on to, but you can hold on to Jesus because He's an immovable high priest that will not let you go, that will not leave you, that will not forsake you. And when things get tough, He's right there with you and He provides the grace to get you through. Yeah, now that's Amen. the high priest that we serve. Anything less than that, I feel like, is just heretical. He wants to say to the other uttermost, those who come to God through Him. You can't come to God except through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't earn your way in there. You can't clean yourself up and come to Jesus. He wants to do the cleaning. I understand repentance, but you have to come to Jesus and beg Him for the help to do it. <clears throat> you can make the choice. You make the decision to turn from sin and trust the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the work of the Holy Spirit of the resurrection, and He will like it says here in Scripture, since He always lives to make intercession for them. He was resurrected and ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, and prays for you and me. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel pretty special. He prays for you and me. You know why He prays for me and you? Because we need it. And He's always praying for us. He's got every hair on our head number. He knows us better than we know us. And He's got more invested in your salvation than we ever will. So why wouldn't we want to serve a high priest like that? I don't know about you, but I like that religion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's the best one in the world, don't you? Mm -hmm. So why did they bring myrrh? Myrrh was a burial herb. These wise men were so far beyond what we ever could give them credit for, I think, I, that I've ever heard any, any knowledge or any, any sermon or anything really talk about what these wise men had. They were tuned in to God. They knew what was going on. They came from pagan nations, and because they were seeking truth, they understood that we need to bring gold because this God is a king. We need to bring frankincense because he is a high priest. We need to bring, bring myrrh because through his priesthood and through his service, he is going to choose to die for humanity. The wise men brought myrrh because it was primarily used to bury people into a tomb. The final gift shows absolutely the gravity of Jesus' obedience. As Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Again, you might want to think that these wise men probably had access to the words of the prophet Isaiah, which said, in Isaiah 15.12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Transgressors. They understood Jesus' mission on this earth, that one day he would be the righteous sacrifice for all of humanity. <clears throat> to illustrate this, I was reminded of Nicodemus, as he made his profession of faith in some of the last chapters of the book of John. man was a Pharisee. He was part of the ruling party that put Jesus on that cross. And what did he do? He made a public profession of faith in midday, they think. 
taking a sackcloth, a sack on his back, almost 75 pounds of herbs and aloes to go and bury Jesus. Myrrh was probably included in those things. <clears throat> you know, I've said it before, Jesus was, has more invested in our salvation than we ever will. He knew it coming in that this was the whole point was to die for humanity, even death on a cross. Maybe that's why Paul said to the church in Galatia, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul understood that because Jesus died for him, he chose to die for Jesus. Now, Paul chose to die a physical death for Jesus. He could have ran at any time. He could have escaped at any time. He was martyred for his faith. But what Jesus asked for us, asked from us, is that we need to die to ourselves. We need to die to ourselves. You can't begin to follow Jesus until you die to yourself. I think for this reason we have confidence we will never fail if we follow Him. Even what may look like a failure will be a beautiful plan of redemption in the making. And as the Scripture implies, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot enter into a temple that is unholy. It must be emptied of us and filled with Him. We must die to ourselves. We must die to our plans. Die to our desires. Die to anything that is contrary to God in our life. We must do it. Our salvation depends on it. <clears throat> in conclusion, these wise men brought three gifts or sacrifices, if you will, to Jesus. Gold because Jesus was a king and a king was born. Not a king of an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly kingdom. <clears throat> Frankincense, because Jesus is our high priest. He is evermore making intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. Myrrh, because Jesus was born to be the righteous and final sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. And our only response must be, I believe, as Hebrews 3, chapter 3, verses 7 through 11 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, I will, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I sworn my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. Today, if you will hear His voice. These wise men set out to seek truth. <clears throat> and are the things that you're living for worth Christ dying for? We must evaluate our lives. We must evaluate ourselves. We must honestly and truly ask, are we worshiping Him the way we ought to be worshiping Him? <clears throat> Jesus is not nearly concerned about the things you do for Him as He is who you are for Him. Who you are for Him. He wants you to live with integrity and confidence that God has done this work in you. Is He your King this evening? Is He your High Priest? Are you living out His religion? <clears throat> Have you died to yourself and allow Christ to be Lord. That's why we come in here. We worship a God that magnified, that beautiful, that much worth living for. Wise men seek the presence of Jesus Christ. They did then and they still do now. For no one is wise who rebels against the God.
And I know it's a Christmas service. <clears throat> and I just wonder if anybody would like to come to the altar tonight and make a decision for this king. That will be the greatest gift you'll ever receive this side of eternity. And I just ask if you would, let's stand, sing 255. Make this a Christmas song. There is a fountain. I am so grateful that Christ came to dwell with us. <clears throat> but I can't help but appreciate His sacrifice so that we may live. Let's let this be our prayer. The altar is open. Lord, that you are our strong power. We've built our house, Lord Jesus, on the rock. 
And I just ask that you would go with us tonight. Lord, out into this fallen world, out into this darkness, Lord Jesus, and help us to be lights for you, Lord Jesus, dead to this world and alive in Christ Jesus. I'm so thankful that this is not our home, that we are pilgrims, and we will pass on, Lord Jesus, into eternity one day. Oh God, let our house be in order, I pray. And so, Lord Jesus, we just do ask and pray that for anybody in here tonight that's wanting to make a decision for you, I pray that they would earnestly be wise and seek you, Lord Jesus, and seek your presence, seek your forgiveness, seek repentance, Lord Jesus, and restitution. Lord, help us to be right with you in every way. And Lord, allow your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, what a privilege to guide us and direct us and make us holy, Lord. Fill us, we pray. We do thank you and praise you for this opportunity. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to us. Not only were you our king and our priest, Lord, but you decided to come, Lord, and <clears throat> take on a body of flesh so that you may be a sacrifice for us all, Lord. I'm so thankful that you've risen from the dead and ascended upon high and are now interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. And so, Jesus, would you please guide us and direct us, help us to live a life that, that looks like all that's going on in us. Help us to bear fruit into eternity. Help us to be your church, beautiful, spotless, pure, and white, Lord, as you have called us to be. Oh, Lord, we just pray and ask that you be with us tonight, Lord. Comfort us. Give us grace and peace in this time of need. And, Lord, help us. <clears throat> help us to shine in the beauty of holiness to those who need it most. We just thank you and praise you, Lord. Send us out on mission now, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Lord, just me. Hug somebody as you go out. <coughs> <coughs> Amen.